How much technology is lying about in your house? For me, there's my phone, laptop, camera stuff, headphone, speaker, and then my housemate's phone, laptop, camera stuff, headphone, speaker. There's also things I can't fit in this shot. Television, fridge, also this, 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 and cables. Everyone always forgets about cables. But that's not everything. We also dug around for our old technology. Sad little discarded phones, once loved, now committed to the domestic equivalent of limbo, cupboards. And everything in this shot, and here, and here, is filled with critical minerals. The precious materials that are mined at the expense of our environment have the potential to spark actual wars, and then end up trapped away doing nothing. Data from the RSC shows that most of us don't recycle technology at the end of its life. A 2019 survey showed that 45% of UK households have up to five unused electronic devices in their home, and 82% have no plans to recycle or sell on their devices after they fall out of use. According to a UN report, on average 7.6 kilograms of e-waste is produced per person each year. But in countries more rapidly intent on constantly buying new tech, like the UK, that figure is closer to 24 kilograms per person. And as well as being a waste of extremely valuable critical minerals, when this old technology ends up spring cleaned out of your gaff and off the landfill, it can cause toxic substances like lead and mercury to leak into soil and water, something I'd generally describe as a bad time. Now, when I think back to the good old days spent with my phone, I feel like a cold and callous lover for having abandoned it so readily when a new, vaguely sexier phone entered my life. So perhaps we could do things slightly differently. Enter, reduce, reuse, repair, recycle. So if you consider what the chances of ending up on a planet are where there is actually all of these materials, a lot of these materials are made in the very rarest stars and only in the very rarest stars. It's quite a special place. We're able to use all this stardust and then you consider how precious this is and then how we behave once we extract this stuff. You can see a scenario where we dig up all the critical minerals in the world, put it all into technology, and we get to the end of life of those technologies. We're unable to recover it, and that's it. You know, you're sustainable for a very short amount of time, you know? That's really the big challenge we face. So the first one is reduce. Um, so if you don't need something, don't buy it. More than an environmental problem, what we have on Earth is an overconsumption problem. Reuse, then, uh, is very important as well. You might not want to hang on to, to a product or a gadget any longer for, for many reasons. But just because you don't need it doesn't mean that somebody out there doesn't need it or want it. That prevents somebody else from buying a new thing. Repair, then, is all about taking things we already have and making them last longer. If you can keep something in use, that means you don't have to make a new thing. That means you're consuming less raw materials, you're opening less mines, there's less impacts from production. And then finally, when none of that is possible, recycling is the last resort. That's absolutely the last thing we should be doing. When we come to recycle, what we're doing is we're breaking something down to a molecular level to harvest those materials to feed back into production. Now, of course, this all sounds pretty simple. Obviously, we shouldn't be discarding critical minerals. They are literally called critical minerals. So this helpfully alliterative slogan seems like the perfect solution, but there are many challenges along the way. The tenants of reduce and reuse rely on consumers being more conscious of their e-waste. Are you really suffering from a harrowing need to replace your phone year on year? Is your television really lacking a new design with marginally better reds or whatever? The problem is that buying new stuff is essentially wired into consumer culture. To convince people to use their technology for longer, to buy second hand, to share their old technology is sort of a battle against shiny ads for shinier products. Repair is a great way of rejuvenating old technology, of lengthening that precious time shared between human and phone. But many products aren't necessarily built to be repaired. Companies would typically rather you buy new than repair an old model, meaning they often lack the infrastructure necessary for repairs. Recycle, though wonderful when it works, requires governments to invest in adequate infrastructure, and this is often lacking. Only 17% of electronic waste is recycled globally. 
and here in the UK, we're particularly not great. In 2019, the UK was found to be the worst offender in Europe for dumping often toxic e-waste abroad, adding to the $10 billion worth of old technology dumped around the globe each year. But whilst this is undoubtedly a global issue, it does seem like some states are better at managing it than others. Take Croatia, who recycled an impressive 81% of their e-waste in 2017, compared to the United States' 15% in 2021. It seems then that individual governments might have the power to improve this quite transparently dire situation, but how? So policy is going to be really important. Um, so if we take, for example, uh, e-waste as, as an example in the UK, not all local authorities have the same rules about recycling e-waste. Uh, so for example, in some local authorities, you can dispose of small tech um, with your sort of household recycling and that's picked up by a, a van or whatever every week. Um, in other places that you have to take it to a household waste recycling centre. Um, and so there's no coherence in terms of the that policy that exists across the UK. And that makes it really difficult for consumers and lots of consumers talk about the fact that they don't know where to recycle their electronics. Um, and that obviously is, is quite a big barrier. What we need is, is, is a really good detailed description of which industries where are consuming critical raw materials, right? You look at where secondary critical raw materials are, where the economic opportunities are for cycling them back into our own economy. There are a number of other things uh, the government could take action on. And, you know, you could incentivize using recovered materials. You could incentivize in a better way designing products for disassembly. Outside of government, many scientific institutions are attempting to address these issues. For instance, scientists in Scotland have developed a new method of separating gold, silver and palladium from old circuitry, using biological and chemical techniques inspired, funnily enough, by the distillation of whiskey. This technique could be cleaner and more efficient than existing methods, which include heating e-waste at over a thousand degrees Celsius, not amazing for the environment, and using cyanide, yes, that cyanide, which, surprise, surprise, creates toxic waste. Uh, a circuit board contains pretty much most of the critical raw materials and the majority of inherent value in a product. We currently send those off to smelting processes. Now, smelting process is a high energy, massive, large scale. They, they heat things up, melt metals. But the problem is there's serious economic and thermodynamic limits to recovering the rest of the critical raw materials that are also important. We need to step away from pyrometallurgy and look more towards chemical processes, hydrometallurgy. So technologies that are gonna help us there are gonna be technologies that help us uh, more effectively dissolve metals and we need to look then on the other end of technologies that can separate and recover these things from solutions. The big problem with power metallurgy is its carbon footprint because it basically means burning right so you have to produce that heat that fire from somewhere and that's typically through the burning of fossil fuels. So we've recently developed quite a lot of precipitation methods where once you've got your metals mobilized we can add a reagent that will then precipitate out the different metals as salts at different pHs and then simply just washing these precipitates with water will then allow you to be able to recover each of the metals um, individually. I'm researching the use of bacteria to help us recover metals from different sources, different wastes. Because biology is so um, sensitive to metals, um, it, it's selective for them as well. These scientific innovations could vastly improve our recycling systems. But other experts believe the problem starts far before recycling challenges. At the moment we buy the thing we're eventually going to chuck away. Maybe the problem is our entire consumer philosophy. We are also constantly bombarded and manipulated by advertisements from producers. Now first, I think we need to be fair to the consumers. First of all, they need to be uh, well informed educated, empowered. But as long as the market signals are telling them the opposite, uh, we are basically asking them to be stupid. To combat these market signals that feed our overconsumption, campaigners all across the world are fighting for right to repair legislation. The argument for right to repair is as follows. The products we use every day are becoming harder and harder to fix. This is because of lack of access to spare parts and their cost, lack of repair documentation and product design that makes disassembly near impossible. Some campaigners also claim that these barriers are intentional, designed to keep us buying and buying and buying new things. In 2019, the Right to Repair campaign helped successfully implement new legislation in the EU. 
meaning that items like fridges, televisions and washing machines were required to be repairable with commonly available tools and include repair documentation. This was a big success, but the campaign still has a long way to go in spreading this legislation around the globe and expanding it to include devices like mobile phones and laptops. The world is facing an e-waste crisis. As well as the human health issues of toxic waste, we're using up precious materials that modern civilization depends on, and adding to the constantly growing demand for these minerals that fuels hazardous mining and geopolitical conflict. You know, we're in the middle of the sixth mass extinction, without a doubt. You know, what we're doing to the oceans, um, climate change picture is obviously terrible. Um, and already, you know, we've, we've, we've pushed ourselves out of the Holocene epoch of our climate, you know. So, you know, that was the very thing that's enabled civilization to establish and grow and remain in one place. I have hope. What I'd like to see, though, is, is, is more joined up effort uh, in order to, to utilize available technologies to do so. Um, more money for research and innovation that addresses all the things we've discussed in this interview would be huge. It's clear that scientists, campaigners, institutions and governments are attempting to address the issue. But it's worth remembering that our own consumer habits feed into this wider system. And perhaps we should demand more from the people that feed our consumption. So maybe it's worth asking yourself how much old tech is lying around in your house. And maybe you could even give some old pals another chance.